I'm going to be talking to you today about understanding and improving microwave cable performance in uh, both aircraft and land vehicles. Um, hmm. There we go. So we did an industry study, uh, over a thousand people out there, um, various jobs in the industry from technicians to design engineers, and asked uh, how often they're replacing or having cables fail on them. The results were quite shocking. Uh, more than 75% of uh, the respondents said that they, their microwave cables fail frequently. About one-fifth are replaced more than once a year. That left only about 24% of the respondents saying they never replace their microwave cables. More specific to the aerospace industry, they tell us, and the industry tells us, that they want these microwave cables to last the lifetime of the aircraft or the system on the aircraft. However, we hear different from the industry. Um, we hear that about 64% accept some amount of failure before the end of the aircraft service life. Even more shocking to us was that some uh, of these respondents said they accept, 41% um, of the respondents accept some sort of failure during the actual installation of these microwave cable assemblies. So we went ahead and looked at why cables are failing. Obviously, there's damage during installation that we just talked about. Specifically to test assemblies, there's damage that occurs during routine use over time. Um, this damage is sometimes because of poor quality construction or the wrong cable being used in the wrong environment. Also, there's connector termination issues with people not using properly calibrated torque wrenches or just a regular wrench and torquing the thing on causing issues with cross-threading, um, which is why we have replaceable connectors. Lastly, there's failure uh, when exposed to environmental conditions that the cable is just not suited for. Now, What's the impact of this? Obviously, you're going to have higher overall purchasing cost if you're having to go ahead and replace these cables over time. Um, some of the intangibles are what I like to focus on, though, and these are delayed production schedules, increase in maintenance, labor, testing, calibration. Um, worst of all is a compromised system performance or test data of DUTs that you're shipping that may or may not be good. Um, and lastly, our safety risks and overall mission success on these mission critical systems that are on these aircraft and land vehicles. So what we like to say is you can't trust the performance if you can't trust the test. So you need to trust both the test assemblies and your airframe or land vehicle assemblies performance over time. Um, with that, we look at how we designed our cables and why we have confidence that these will work in your applications. We'll start with the first three layers of the cable assembly. They're very common for a coax cable. You have your center conductor, your EPTFE dielectric uh, made at Gore, and a helically wrapped uh, silver plated outer conductor. Now these three things are gonna define your electrical performance. It's our job from then to protect them in the environment that you're going to use them in. So we start adding some layers. We add a braid um, that helps with mechanical strength, also some torsion. Um, for the aerospace cable, we add a vapor barrier. Now that's going to help with moisture ingress. Um, the ideal dielectric constant of air, about one. Uh, water, about 80. So you definitely don't want water vapor being trapped in your pores of your dielectric. That'll change your impedance. We also add a crush membrane. For the Gore Flight or Flight um, product, we've got greater than 75 pounds per inch of crush proofness. For the face flex product, we've got greater than 250 pounds per inch of crush proofness, so you could run it over with a cart, essentially. Don't do it, but you could. Um, we add some other layers, liquid barriers and some other strength layers. And then lastly, um, a low friction abrasion resistant outer jacket. That's going to help you with the sharp edges, whether that be in an airframe or in the lab on a desk. So. We've got the cables. How do we make sure they're going to work in the application? Well, we've got to test them up front. We've got to test before we ship. We've got to qualify before we ship. So we start looking at phase stability, things that are important for test assemblies. And we look at that broadband through 18 gigahertz. Um, as you can see in the graph here, um, we've got very good phase stability. What we do is we wrap it around a mandrel in uh, 
clockwise and counterclockwise directions, then rotate the connector uh, 90 degrees and do the same. So we get a good 360 degree coverage of that cable assembly and how phase stable it is, or in some cases it's not. So as you can see, our cable here straight out of the box looks very good, about one degree of phase instability. Um, we tested some alternatives and we saw that they were around six degrees straight out of the box of phase instability at 18 gigahertz. Now, that equates to about one picosecond. Now, if you're doing absolute uh, phase matching here in, in time, that one picosecond, that's, that's normal for us to do matched cables at, um, that's uncertainty in your measurement that now you can't measure. We also looked at it over time, and, and by over time I mean we flexed the cable in a tick-tock manner, about 20 uh, rotations per minute, um, 90 degrees one way, 90 degrees the other way, so a full 180. And then we looked at how phase and loss perform. So the phase, right where it used to be, you can see our internal spec lines here through 18 in green. We're still at about one degree of phase uh, change. However, some of the alternatives here are drastically different. You see anywhere from the six degrees to up to 24 degrees of phase change here. A similar story occurs with loss stability over time, and this is just regular use. A flex test is pretty representative of what these test cables are gonna see. Um, once again, you see the gore line buried right in between our spec line at zero. Um, our spec's about 0.2 dB through 18. Um, you see some of the alternatives, however, uh, drastically different. One, obviously, you're gonna catch as a failure. You see that, that lower one, you're gonna be failing your DUTs, you're gonna be failing your flight line testing when you see results like that. And you're gonna find that cable and you're gonna replace it, hopefully. Um, the one on top is the one that scares me more because that could lead to false negatives. Uh, it could make your data look better than it's actually supposed to look. So you could be passing devices that aren't supposed to pass. You could be passing mission uh, critical systems that are actually failing because you've added about a dB of gain here through 18. Now, we talked about test assembly testing. Now I'd like to talk about aerospace assembly testing. So earlier I said the respondents to the survey mentioned that about 41% accepted some fallout uh, during installation. So we got feedback from our customers and we designed an installation simulator to mock up an airframe install because it's kind of difficult to get on these airframes sometimes. Um, we intended it to be pulled through the airframe installer with about 30 to 40 pounds of tension. And some of the features we added here are the uh, guides and routes to induce that torque. And we've got some zoomed pictures of it. And we also added some mandrels. Now there's four mandrels um, at the minimum bend radius of the cable and it imparts a rolling minimum bend radius over the entire length of the cable. We've also included a offset edge here now this is the scrape against the cable's jacket, which could happen in an airframe install as you're running through a bulkhead. So we invented this, and then we wanted to look at the data both before and after we routed the cable through. These are all the features here. Now, um, so we're gonna look at it in terms of insertion loss and VSWR, very common things to look at here. Um, out of the box, us along with most of the alternatives look very good. They look like their data sheet says they do. Very smooth insertion loss curves, very controlled VSWR broadband through 18. However, after a few installs through the simulator, we see very different results. The Gore cable here still looks very smooth, very controlled insertion loss. However, the alternatives become quite grainy and have some resonances developing past six gigahertz. So the cable is essentially becoming un unstable and could start failing specifications and testing. Um, to relate that in terms of VSWR, we see after install or mock install, the Gore flight cable assembly is still below 1.2 to 1 VSWR. Um, however, the uh, alternative cable assembly is above 2 to 1 now, and that's, those are the spikes you saw in the insertion loss curve. Um, this implies that the impedance is greatly changed at locations down the length of the cable um, due to mechanical damage, most likely the outer conductor uh, becoming dented or something like that. Um, we also look at something we call shake stability. Now we normalize the uh, insertion loss curve and we shake it onto a table. It's not really a qualified test by any means, but it's a feel good test that we like to run to say, how's the cable doing overall? Just roughly. 
Um, the GORE cables um, are generally within 0.02 dB um, after normalizing your S parameter, your insertion loss trace. Um, however, the alternatives become greatly unstable. Um, this is just one screenshot. Normally, you'd see these results very broadband, and that instability would be very broadband um, because your wiggling it is changing actively. So that's just another degree of uncertainty that it gets added in here. We also looked at shielding effectiveness. Now, as power requirements go up, as frequencies go up in these military systems, uh, as there's more transmitters and receivers on the same uh, aircraft right next to one another, it's important to look at shielding effectiveness. Um, what we found was that our assemblies are generally about 10 dB over the MIL-T requirements for thread-on connectors. However, some of the alternatives are actually failing this specification, although they're signed up for it. Now, talking to customers, they don't actually do this testing on single cable assemblies. You know, they, these guys are going to install it in their airframe, and they're going to put the whole airframe in to do their shielding effectiveness test. So they might not find the errors until the very end, and then you've already got the cables installed. Um, so that, that's a worry that we bring up. Um, Essentially, what we've talked about here today is trying to reduce the impact of replacing these cable assemblies in, in an airframe, in a test lab, on a flight line, in a land vehicle. Um, what we hear from the industry is that the current solutions are not meeting these industry expectations. They're having to replace cables, pull cables out, and it's causing them some headaches. Um, we want to make sure that they're using the right test cables. We've been on flight lines and we've seen them be using test cables that um, are very unstable, uh, so we've had these conversations with them, and we try to encourage them to use the proper test cables that uh, give them confidence that the DUTs that they're testing are going to perform actually in a mission. Um, the impact, obviously, we talked about replacement cost. Um, that's the most direct impact, it's the most quantifiable. However, some of the intangible things are just as important, if not more important such as that compromised system performance and, action, and uh, production delays as well. Um, the solution really is to do your research uh, to give the requirements up front. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to talk to everyone about the requirements, where the cable is being used, and make sure that it's a fit-for-use solution in the application. Um, with that being said, I, I invite you to learn more at our websites. There's videos, white papers, et cetera. And uh, I got about two minutes left here for questions. So if anyone has any questions, I'll open up the floor for that. And thank you for your time.